The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, T. Rowe, Price Australia Limited, ABN 136206689589, AFSL 5037411, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Welcome listeners, as we embark on an exhilarating journey into the world of impact investing. I'm your host, Karen McLeod, and I'm thrilled to guide you through this four-part series where we'll explore the dynamic landscape of finance with a conscience. It's more than just numbers on a spreadsheet. It's about driving change and shaping a future where prosperity knows no bounds. So join me on this exhilarating journey as we explore how finance meets purpose. Investing used to be just about making a meaningful return on your investment. But what if your investment could not only deliver a return on your investment, but also do more good, both environmentally and socially, for the world we all live in? The opportunities now to own quality businesses that have the potential to create a positive impact on society and the planet are broader than they have ever been. T. Rowe Price is a premier global asset management organisation actively investing in opportunities to help people thrive in an evolving world. By understanding clients' needs and delivering timely, actionable insights and solutions, we can help them navigate change and achieve better outcomes. Hello and welcome everyone to our first episode on impact investing. Today we have an exciting agenda lined up for you as we delve into the nuances of this niche area. I'm your host, Karen McLeod from Ethical Investment Advisors, and I'm really thrilled to be joined by our special guest, Hari Krishna, Portfolio Manager for the Global Impact Equity Strategy at T. Rowe Price, based in London. Hari is a seasoned fund manager with extensive experience in impact investing, and we're eager to learn from his expertise. So let's dive right in. Welcome, Hari. Thank you, Karen. It's great to be here. So, Hari, as our expert uh, for this podcast, could you please begin by clarifying some of the common terms? As advisors, we often hear this terminology like ESG, ethical, responsible, and impact investing used interchangeably. Could you shed some light on the key differences between the terms and maybe feel free to give some examples? Absolutely, Karen. And and actually, it's, it's one of my, as an impact manager, it's one of my pet peeves, actually, that we get battling with a whole range of other type of ESG funds. But I think level setting on kind of the terminology would, would be great. So if I start with, you know, the traditional notion of, you know, how ESG came about, right? ESG was very much, uh, you know, it, it had its beginnings in effectively risk management tools, right? So thinking about a company's own environmental or social footprints and making sure that there was nothing out of the ordinary that these companies were engaging in, right? So if this is an oil company, you know, are they engaging in a whole bunch of oil spills? Or if this is a consumer staples company, are they not responsibly sourcing their raw materials, for instance, right? And so those flags obviously had real financial implications down the track, whether, the, you know, those went fines or that been getting, you know, banned from, you know, consumer preferences and things like that. That that obviously is still a very, very important part of financial markets. And I think absolutely, you know, that kind of investing, you know, in terms of ESG integration, I believe is is frankly table stakes, you know, for most investors, because you've got to think about the negative externalities of the investments uh, that you're investing in and the financial implications of that. Mm-hmm. Impact, in my humble opinion, is, is is very different, right? So impact is all about it has a much more outward focus and is much more focused on a company's impact on the environment and on society. And, you know, what is the, you know, effectively, what is the potential solution this company is providing to solve for an environmental or social issue? And I think the best way to illustrate this is, you know, using an example, right? So if you think about one of the companies that we're invested in, it's called Train Technologies, right? So Train Technologies, they basically provide efficient heating, ventilation, air conditioning solutions uh, for a lot of um, industrial applications, data centers, and commercial settings, right? So when you think about the fact that buildings and you know buildings in their entirety represent you know thirty five percent of all greenhouse gas emissions in the world, the need to decarbonize buildings you know becomes ever more important, and the need to decarbonize all these you know data centers as well that are getting built because of AI and things like that. So, mm-hmm. enter train technologies. You know what they do is by replacing or providing an efficient solution you know for actually you know heating or cooling these buildings, they've averted in in twenty twenty 
to 43 million metric tons of CO2 equivalent for their consume, for their customers. Now that is that is how we think about things from an impact perspective. What is a company's role in providing a solution to reduce greenhouse gases, to promote a healthy ecosystem, or to enable social equity through financial inclusion and so on and so forth? If you looked at train using like an ESG integration lens, you'd say, well, okay, what is train's own manufacturing footprint? What is train's own carbon emissions? And you know, what is their journey, their own journey to get a net zero, which is very different to train's role in helping the world achieve a net zero outcome, if that, if that makes sense. And then obviously in the middle between ESG integration and impact, you've got, you know, different terminologies, right? So ethical or, you know, responsible. And those tend to be much more based on exclusions, right? So where the end client has a, a preference for a certain sector to be screened out. And you know, typically you'll find sectors like tobacco or fossil fuels, in some cases of tobacco as, as some of the more popular exclusions uh, from those kind of funds. But impact tends to be much more of a outward looking, you know, forward looking, positive outcome oriented, um, you know, investment process. And the other big difference between impact and all other styles of ESG investing tends to be around the measurability, right? So as impact investors, there's got to be a material, positive, measurable impact that these companies are actually having on the planet or on society that has got to be measured and reported on to our end clients. And then the other big difference is using strategic engagement, impact managers want to actually improve the impact from their investments as well. Right, so that's the other big difference uh, here as well. So, like in terms of driving an impact agenda or a change agenda with uh, our portfolio companies, that's that's a really great point. Do you have an example there um, of an engagement you can think of that you've been successful in achieving with the company? Yeah, I can give you a couple of examples. Right, so so we're, we're invested in uh, life science tools uh, as a sector. Right, so these are companies that basically provide biopharma, biotech, and large pharmaceutical companies the necessary medical tools to actually come up with all the innovative cures that we see today. So when you think about cell and gene therapy, immunology, uh, Alzheimer's, uh, you know, GLP-1s, you know, a, lot, a lot of these companies are providing the uh, necessary tools to those companies. Mm -hmm. We engage with, you know, one of our portfolio companies there where, you know, the link between what they were doing was clearly a positive impact, you know, uh, activity the link between kind of what they were doing and the eventual patient outcomes, uh, they, they weren't necessarily being fully, uh, I mean, they, they had a data, they just weren't, you know, you know, uh, reporting it, right? And so our involvement there was basically um, impressing upon them the importance of actually disclosing that data and their positive impact on society, in this case, healthcare. And we actually, you know, showed them examples of best practice around the world. And that's one of the nice things about being... Uh, a listed equity impact manager, you can see examples of best practice in other companies. And that resulted in, you know, eventually a, a year later, this company coming up with an impact report and talking about their own impact on on healthcare and, and patient outcomes. So that's an example where you've got a company that's doing really good things, but mm. we're just kind of bringing them along to actually disclose. And in other cases, you know, we will work with, and we've done this, but we work with large cap companies in the industrial gases space where you know we might get a seat at the table with the board of directors, the C-suite, and we'll talk to them about the importance of accelerating green hydrogen deployment or you know their own renewable energy generation, for example. In some cases, with small, small companies, we can work with them on you know target setting, for example, right, and helping them actually change managerial behavior to drive and result in a more positive impact outcome. Mm, that's actually a very good point that you raise. Do you find? that the level of traction you get from C-suite or company executives is is greater in small companies or medium-sized companies, or is it like where do you find the most cut through with what you're discussing with them? I, I would actually say, you know, and this is one thing, you know, I, I sort of really defer in my views, I think, compared to kind of what, what accepted views are in this in, on this topic, right? And, and I actually find the large cap and even mid cap companies really care about their product sustainability because they know, I mean, the kind of companies we invest in, they're providing a effectively a solution for reducing greenhouse gases and so, or a, a solution for improving financial inclusion, for instance. So they really care about the product sustainability of what they're offering because only then can their products actually be viable for the lo long term. And that results in a superior financial uh, algorithm and outcome for those companies. And so what ends up there is, if we're working with a large cap company, they kind of want to hear what we have to say as impact managers 
just as much as a small cap company does. Now, what the difference is with a small cap company, we can probably handhold and help a little bit more because typically they don't necessarily have access to the resources that a large cap company would have along the dimensions of impact measurement, for instance, right? But in terms of the intentionality or the willingness of companies to engage and, and care about how they want to change their practice for the better, I've actually found a pretty consistent outcome for both small and large cap alike. And you know, being part of a large asset manager, this is one of the the blessings with those engagements. You know, we actually end up getting a seat at the table with the boards or with the C suite to talk about these issues, which you know is distinct from you know, let's say, a traditional kind of financial dialogue with these companies. And that's that's made a huge difference to our ability to uh, encourage uh, you know our companies to progress and impact agenda. Mm, that's really fascinating that you're getting progress in both areas, small, medium, and large. I guess so. Just thinking about some different impact investments that you've made in terms of maybe comparing and contrasting further a little bit more for the listeners, positive social and positive environmental incomes. Do they have to be mutually exclusive or do you sometimes find that you can actually achieve both by selecting certain companies or engaging in certain practices with certain companies? It's a great question, Karen. I mean, the way we think about it is uh, our definition of what qualifies as an impact investment is the revenue alignment to these positive impact activities, right? Whether that's reducing greenhouse gases or, you know, enabling the circular economy or enabling financial inclusion or healthcare, that's got to be material, right? And the reason it's got to be material, and we define materiality as majority of revenues exposed to that activity, is it it re- it significantly reduces the risk of greenwashing, right? Because what we don't want is, you know, investing in companies where they do a whole bunch of other things and the positive impact activity is like 1% of revenues, right? Because that that tells you the intentionality of the company to actually focus on that solution just isn't there. So typically what we find is when we classify a company as providing a solution along one of these dimensions, they typically will have most of their revenues aligned to that activity, right? So if this is a company like uh, Hubble, for example, we're invested in the U.S., uh, Hubble provides electrical equipment that enables electrification of the U.S. grid primarily. That is pretty much Hubble's business, right? That's pretty much what they do. If you look at uh, the example of Danaher and Life Science Tools, like I spoke to you earlier about, Danaher's pretty much entirely their business is focused on bioproduction and helping companies uh, with these tools to actually produce things like monoclonal antibodies for cancer. Mm-hmm. There will be some overlap in some cases. I mean, a, a company that provides, uh, you know, an environmental solution might also have, um, you know, some aspect of the business that might, you know, enable an SME, for example. So there might be a financial inclusion angle there. But by and large, you know, we classify the majority of revenues to a primary, um, you know, set to their positive impact activity. Mm-hmm. Um, in terms of the distinction between environmental and social, what I'd say is on the environmental side, uh, it's definitely easier to measure outcomes in the environmental side because you can actually distill things down to, you know, like a metric ton CO2 equivalent mitigated or saved or, you know, or, or renewable energy, you know, megawatt hours of renewable energy generated, for example. Mm-hmm. And so what we look for is in reducing greenhouse gases, these are companies that directly generate renewable power or companies that provide energy efficient uh, solutions like train or, you know, Hubble as an example. Companies that help decarbonize or improve air quality, for example, um, we look, look for companies that improve ecosystems, so like you know water infrastructure improvement. Companies that help serve water, right? And then on the circular economy side, companies that reduce manufacturing waste, or companies that you know through their business model will help to effectively convert some waste product into a usable, you know, consumer oriented product. So, like you know, as an example, you know, we own a stock called Trex. Um, Trex basically takes plastic out of landfill um, and converts that into composite decking so that, you know, people can use um, as, yeah. as a you know backyard decking solution. Okay. And then on the social side, you know, on the social side, we look for companies that will, you know, uh, enable financial inclusion. So these could be, you know, within uh, developed, you know, economies where, you know, providing credit and access to, you know, unbanked SMEs or, consumers don't get access to credit or in emerging market situations, retail and commercial banks providing loans to basically, uh, it, you know, retail individuals and micro SMEs to enable financial inclusion there. And obviously healthcare is self-explanatory. You know, we invest in companies that enable healthcare innovation or companies that, you know, do groundbreaking innovation and in what they do uh, as, as, as examples. Hmm. 
It sounds like, you know, you're providing advisors with the opportunity to connect their investors with in- investments that can deliver positive financial returns, but so much more than that, they're doing good while also re- receiving such a positive return. And it, with so many problems to be solved in the world, would you would you estimate that the universe will be growing for you of investments that you can select from as we go forward? I'm just thinking the nature positive, let, you know, laws that are coming out here and there the are lots of changes to regulations. With Do you feel that more companies will be in your universe going forward? How would you, where do you see things going? Look, Karen, you brought up uh, the word financial and, and I actually think financial and positive impact, you know, genuinely go hand in hand, right? So, you know, by no means, you know, by investing in these companies, and that's a really nice thing about impact, right? We're not making a values judgment on anyone or anything, right? So this isn't like, I'm going to exclude this sector or that sector. It's like we are, you know, actively looking for companies and we're exclusively investing in companies that provide solutions for better environmental and social outcomes. Now, what I'd say on that is those companies that actually do that successfully, and as long as you stick to your fundamental tenets of investing, so, you know, we're focused on companies in a good industry structure led by good management teams that allocate capital well, but we don't overpay for the assets. So we look for uh, double-digit IRRs using a price-to-free cash flow multiple. These are the kind of companies that exactly have the advantage that we're looking for, right? So if you think about the business model advantage they get, so again, let's just even go back to some of those examples we spoke about earlier, right? You look at Train as an example. Because Train is averting so many million metric tons of CO2 for their customers, and there's all these large companies out there like Microsoft and Amazon, they have net zero targets, you have all these factories that have net zero targets. And so a company that actually helps their customers achieve those net zero targets actually has a top line advantage, right? And so we're seeing that come through in Twain's numbers, right? So what used to be a three to four percent organic growth business is still mm-hmm. printing like a six, eight, ten percent organic growth profile because they're benefiting from these mega trends, right? If you look at, you know, financial inclusion in emerging markets, for for example, you know, we're invested in a company like BCA in Indonesia. Um, you know, if you think about credit penetration in Indonesia, it is multiple decades behind that of developed markets, right? And so what, we, what we're playing for here is BCO is providing credit to those SMEs and retail individuals, but while it's doing that, the growth in credit penetration that's driving the financial inclusion is actually resulting in superior book value growth for BCA, right? So effectively what I'm trying to say in a long way is the positive impact activity is actually translating into better fundamentals for these companies. Yes, I can hear that loud and clear. But as an investor on behalf of clients, I suppose there is still a concern that is is there greenwashing involved in any of these investments? Maybe you could explain just exactly how you make sure that you take steps to avoid that greenwashing when selecting investments so that they're generally impactful in, their, in, in what they're doing. Yeah. yeah. But it's, and it's, it's frankly, Karen, that is actually what keeps me awake at night most is making sure that everything we do is authentic, right? And because, you know, the last thing you want is inadvertently to realize you might have the best of intentions, but inadvertently you might realize that, you know, a company was doing something it was, wasn't supposed to do, for instance, right? And so that is something that is very, very critical and important to our process. So the way we the way we sort of solve for that is along three dimensions, right? So the first one is, I spoke about it a little bit earlier, which was the materiality aspect, right? So materiality is all about ensuring that the overwhelming majority of a company's revenue is aligned towards that positive impact solution, right? So if you take Train, for example, you know, pretty much the whole business exists to decarbonize customer carbon footprints, right? Or if you take Brookfield Renewable Partners, the whole business exists. It's one of the biggest renewable investors in the world. The whole business exists to generate renewable energy, right? And so in cases like that, you know, we will make sure that when that materiality revenue exists, uh, it significantly reduces that risk of greenwashing already. The second thing we do is we uh, engage with all our companies, right, to test intentionality, right? So we want to make sure that, you know, these are companies that genuinely care about making a difference and their products. And we generally find, by the way, the two go hand in hand. The ones that actually care about making a difference tend to have better products, and those better products tend to be more in demand, and that results in better financial outcomes, right? So that's the the second thing we do. The third thing we do is, we still apply traditional ESG integration tools to all our 
um, stock. So we will still, uh, but we also make sure that there's no risk out there that we're sort of unaware of, right? Like some supply chain issue or like uh, a sourcing issue of like a raw material that is like banned or, you know, anything like that, right? So those are, we have a good example of that would be like polysilicon. So when you look at solar, you know, manufacturers, you want to make sure the polysilicon is sourced responsibly. Um, and so again, that, that's an example of something we would do, do as well. And then the final one I'd say is just on impact itself, because impact effectively the definition of impact is all about making sure that not only do you have this material exposure, you, you can also measure the impact, effectively forcing you to put down like a metric or a key performance indicator that links, you know, effect, you know links the investment to the outcome uh, is another way to sort of prevent greenwashing, right? So like if if I just came up with an idea, but I, I wasn't able to demonstrate that there, were, there was actually a, a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions or actually an improvement in financial inclusion, you know, in your, in your, in your, it would be in your right as a client to say, well, in that case, that doesn't seem to qualify, right? And so because we have to disclose it for every single stock that we own in the portfolio, um, you know, hopefully that gives clients comfort that, you know, at least from our end, you know, we do everything we can to make sure that, uh, you know, there isn't, you know, greenwashing kind of, kind of ideas here. I'm very reassured by that, Hari. I'd, and um, I'd just like to ask, I suppose, further on from that, because this is an evolving sector in the responsible investment um, sector, I suppose, how do you how do you view additional items oh, like right. investing? Like what else will you be looking for? Will it be First Nations issues? Will it be what are the other issues that you will be benchmarking for impact, I guess, going forward? <clears throat> It's a great, great question. I, I guess what we'd be looking for constantly, Karen, is actually to deliver a positive impact as well. And so what we're trying to do there is we're trying to maximize the impact that we can from our investments. And so when we look for additional elements, right? So one of the things we look for is firstly, are we invested in the best in class idea within the universe that we look at, right? And so to give you an example, um, not every pharmaceutical or healthcare company is created equal, right? So if we're looking for groundbreaking therapeutic innovation when looking for what are the greatest unmet needs from a disease perspective that needs to be solved for, right? So if you take cancer, for instance, which is one of the top three in the world, um, we are invested in, in a company, Daiichi Sankyo listed in Japan, that has uh, an antibody drug conjugate um, offering, which is, you know, in our view, going to become the standard of care uh, for treating cancer with immuno-oncology. And so picking the company where based on our analysis, that is the company that, in our view, is going to have the greatest impact in curing cancer in the coming years and decades to come uh, is, is one aspect of what we look for. The second thing we look for is, you know, when we're investing in these companies, does the company itself have that intentionality, right, uh, you know, to, to basically make sure that they're actually providing the solution, you know, for a better environment or a better, so, a better social outcome. Uh, and that's the other thing that, you know, simple test uh, that, you know, we can kind of level set ourselves on. And then the other thing we'd look for is what is the potential for us to improve the impact from that investment? So coming back to that engagement and additionality piece I spoke to you earlier about, how can we make sure we can actually, you know, really work with these companies as partners and, and really try and drive improved impact, you know, in, in the coming years? And th th those would be other aspects we would look for. Impact tends to be broad, like I said, across environmental and social dimensions. So Anything that 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 sort of brings to the fore, I think, is something we would we would be very focused on. That's very interesting. And do you find that you would encourage advisors who are recommending impact investments for their clients to engage in conversations with you um, as the portfolio manager if they had queries about metrics or measurements or outcomes? Is that is it a two way conversation as well between the portfolio manager and the investor or the advisor? What can you speak to that on? It absolutely is, Karen, and the reason it absolutely is, and I think you mentioned it yourself. I mean, we are, you know, a more nascent industry or a newer industry, right? In the sense of, you know, we, you know, we're listed equity impact hasn't been around for that long, and a big part of that two-way dialogue is to make us better, so that the whole industry can be better, right? So, and what do I mean by that? So, if yeah, and, and by the way, we've, we've hugely benefited from getting that sort of two-way feedback from from a range of our clients, right? So, whether that is um, helping us think about new KPIs to measure stocks against, whether that is thinking about, um, okay, we're looking at something from a greenhouse gas mitigation angle, 
but what are some of the negative externalities of a certain business, for example? Uh, these are all, you know, aspects of feedback or like our annual report. We publish an annual report that measures the impact from every single stock that we're invested in on an annual basis. And we've had a lot of feedback, you know, from clients on, you know, how we could improve on that disclosure, how we could make it more granular, how we could track it better over time. Uh, and, and all of that has resulted, you know, we, we've been around now for three years. It's resulted in hopefully incremental improvement in every iteration of the annual report or every iteration of the measurement, uh, also for our own internal processes as well. Um, so I'd absolutely encourage that. So advisors or clients, you know, who want to engage with us on, you know, disclosures or views they have on the fund and the holdings, uh, it's, it's definitely something that, you know, we welcome. We like to be transparent. You know, we want to be transparent, not just about what we own and how we measure it, but on a quarterly basis, you know, we also talk about stocks that we, you know, initiated on or eliminated on and why, and, you know, the, the, the reasons from an impact and a financial standpoint in terms of, you know, why we made those moves. That's very insightful, I think, because I would, I would definitely also reach out to those advisors listening and let them know that often, I think the underlying clients that impact investments often suit are the clients that have questions or are the clients that have um, insights to share. So it's great if we can get them at the table as well, because it will continue to strengthen the whole sector, of course. And then, of course, the investments themselves and the returns that we can deliver for them, as you said. So um, just before we wrap up, Hari, is there anything that you would like to impart on the listeners um, as a final message? Look, I think probably the most important thing I'd like to impart, Karen, is just that, you know, when people look at funds within the ESG umbrella, right? Um, mm -hmm. I think it's really important to just like just like you would with any potential fund or any manager, right? Like you 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 do your sort of full due diligence on those managers and in their investment process and you know how they do things. I think this exactly the same is true in the ESG arena. So I think, you know, while you, you know, I, I spoke a lot about, you know, impact investing and how we do things, I think it's it's very, very important for everyone to do that due diligence and get comfortable with the processes that you know fund managers follow when they put a label on something. And I think it's really important, particularly in the impact world, to make sure that the link between the dollars invested and the outcomes that resulted from the dollars invested are documented and measurable, right? And that's something that I encourage everyone to think about uh, on their on their sort of impact journey. And then, you know, finally, I'd say I couldn't be more excited about the role that impact investing in listed equity markets is going to play in the coming years and decades to come. We've got a five trillion US dollar per year funding gap to achieve the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, and the more capital that is in this area in in genuine impact investing, I think, can hopefully discover, you know, just like you know, you know, in, in Nvidia's sort of trailblazing artificial intelligence, it would be great to have companies that can trailblaze and truly find solutions for you know, better planet and better society uh, in the coming years and decades to come. And for that, we need capital, right? And capital is the only way that's going to solve that, solve that, um, solve that question. So I'm really excited about what I see, and uh, I, I really appreciate everyone's time, um, you know, in, in listening. I couldn't have said it better. I, I, would, I would definitely agree with what you said there, Hari. Definitely to the advisors, do your due diligence. Make sure you're selecting a fund that's reputable and that can actually walk the talk and understand what you're investing in. Make sure there's complete transparency, and the reporting is there in terms of the impact and continue to have that dialogue with the managers involved and also with your clients to make sure it suits their needs, of course. But I completely agree. We've got a lot of work to do, but impact investment will certainly be part of that strategy. Make sure you avoid the greenwashing and it looks like a really bright future ahead for Australian investors with their advisors, giving them appropriate advice on impact investing. Thanks so much for joining us, Hari. Thank you, Thank you very much. Appreciate it.